Good morning. I'm Glenn Lowry, director of the Museum of Modern Art, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this conversation with Paola Antonelli, our brilliant curator about items, one of the first, maybe the first exhibition of fashion at the museum in a very long time, and we'll get to that in a moment. I, I just want to begin by saying this exhibition is supported by Hyundai Card, and we're extremely grateful to Hyundai Card for their ongoing commitment to the Museum of Modern Art, and especially to all things architectural and design related. And Paula, in one of her earlier iterations, uh, did a number of projects in Seoul with Hyundai Card. So it's a nice connection. Uh, it is also the first exhibition to take place in the newly named Stephen and Alexandra Cohn Center for Special Exhibitions on the sixth floor. And you will uh, have seen that we have taken what were two modestly scale galleries and combined them into one quite large gallery. Just enough. Just enough. <laughs> this happens to be true with Paula all the time. Because all curators. <laughs> well, all curators, but it's one of Paula's specialties. She can inhabit any amount of space uh, and make it look fantastic. Uh, I hope you'll, you'll share. Gaseous. <laughs> share our enthusiasm for this show. Major support for the exhibition also came from WGSN, and the paint was provided by Farrell and Ball. How lucky are we for those beautiful colors. So, Paula, uh, I want to start at the beginning. Items. We could have called this exhibition any number of uh, different names. Why items, and is fashion modern? We really wanted to make sure that would be clear to everyone that this is a fashion show indeed, but it's first and foremost a design show that takes fashion as its focus. We wanted therefore to, um, to communicate instantly that the exhibition is about the individual objects. It's not about names, it's not about styles, it's about objects that stand in for whole periods for whole issues. So that was a declaration of intent items. Because the only way to call a garment or a piece of fashion, not a number, but something else is item. And I have to say, uh, the curatorial team and I, by the way, I'm sorry, can you stand up? Yes. I want you to look, please, I told yeah. you to stand up. It's an order. <laughs> so turn around. Yeah, this Bravo. is. Bravo. Michelle, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly, really. Thank you. Thank you for winning your shyness. Um, but immediately we were looking for a very strong title of one word. And what we did right away is we put together an advisory committee and then we test run the whole um, series of titles with them. And I have to say, it really resonated with fashion people. Fashion people are jaded, especially when you try to put names on them. Items, for some reason, really worked. The subtitle is Fashion Modern is because we wanted, number one, to let people know that it is a show about fashion. And number two, we wanted to connect superstitiously to the only other fashion show that ever happened at MoMA, which is Bernard Rudofsky's 1944, Our Clothes Modern, question mark. Hence. So every 70 years, please come back for a major <laughs> fashion statement from the Museum of Modern Art. With a question mark. <laughs> With a question mark. Um, but more importantly, you put together an advisory uh, team, and I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about that remarkable group of people in what you challenge them to help you with. It's really a remarkable group of people. Many of them, unfortunately, right now are in Europe because it's the fall fashion kermesse. But uh, it's a group that is made of scholars, journalists, designers. The scholars range from Penny Martin, who is also a journalist. She's the founder of The Gentlewoman, to Valerie Steele, who's the director of the FIT Museum. Amongst the designers, Shane Oliver, used to be Hood Bayer, now it's Helmut Lang. Amongst the journalists, uh, our great pals at Paper Magazine, Kim and Mickey, Kim Astrider and Mickey Boardman. But also, we had amazing advisors all over the world, like Malika Kashyap in India and Bandana Tewari or Moyemi Akerele in Nigeria, um, and many others, about 18 people. But to make a long story short, the way we challenged them was to um, offer us their expertise and their know-how, but help us with something that was a little bit outside of their comfort zone, which was an exhibition that didn't have only great spectacular fashion, but also why briefs. And I have to say, um, 
we learned so much from them, but we were so pleased to see that they were stimulated too, and that it was a challenge for them. So, and then also we opportunistically took advantage of them in different areas of the world or in different areas of the fashion expertise. So you mentioned the Y briefs, and I'd mentioned some of the shoes because I have a foot fetish and a shoe fetish, but we can all... Sorry that we don't have socks. I'm sorry. It, it's like, it was like number 112. I know, and I brought tears to my eyes when I realized that. But, you know, I got over it because you have enough shoes to satisfy that side of my interest. But much more importantly, um, there are 111 items. How did you go about choosing them, and what do they stand for? You know the answer, you know all the answers, but it's nice to repeat it in front of you. This is um, something that goes back a few years, and actually Glenn is central to this process. So when I came to MoMA, it was 23 years ago, and there was no fashion in the, in the collection. There was only one Fortuny dress that had been donated in the 80s. It was kind of a mysterious story, nothing else. And having grown up in Milan, I felt that it was missing not your typical kind of fashion, but some basics, some basics like, uh, you know, the equivalent in fashion of the famous MoMA ball bearing would be the white t-shirt, or the equivalent of uh, the beanbag chair, or the sacco chair would be a piece uh, by Ray Cavacubo, for instance. There were these pieces that were missing and that were important to tell the history of modern design. So I started making a list of, uh, that was called Garments That Changed the World. Right? Just in handmit, handwritten. By the way, in, I loved that title. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's not think small. Garments that change the world. So I started making this list, and then opportunistically, every now and then, there would be one thing sliding into the collection. We did a, we did a show called Humble Masterpieces in 2004 in Queens, the white T-shirt. We did one about safety, safe, the parka for homeless by Final Home. So slowly but surely, a few pieces made it in. But Glenn knew that I had this list garments that change the world. And a few years ago, he told me, have you ever thought of making an exhibition out of it? And with my typical souplesse and uh, flexibility, I said, hell no, that, that's for the collection. And <laughs> then, after all, he's my boss, I started thinking about it. And uh, it, it, I have to say, it really is amazing how it blossomed into an exhibition. The spine is the original garments that change the world. And whenever you start with a central spine, then you start putting material onto it, you start padding it, and then you start, I, I spent a little too much time with the dressers upstairs, but you pad it and then you take off and you sculpt it. And also all together with the curatorial team, we, um, we had different agendas that we wanted to fit in the exhibition, geographies, cultures, subcultures, politics. And uh, that's how we came to the list. Originally it was 99, then we uh, went up to 111 because we needed more, but the original list is, was about 400, as I'm sure you could come up with if you spent an afternoon making your own list. Well, it seems to me that one of the things this exhibition does is it invites a public to continue the list. So if here are the first 111 items to consider, there are presumably hundreds if not thousands more. And I, I like that aspect, that this is not a closed list, but rather an invitation to think about the way in which fashion is constructed. And from that, I want to move to the way you've looked at types, prototypes, archetypes, stereotypes, that there is a dimension here of trying to understand how something enters into our consciousness as an item of importance. So do you want to talk a little bit about the kind of infrastructure, the intellectual infrastructure to some of the exhibition? Thank you. Yeah, the way design is represented at MoMA is ideally, in Bauhausian uh, terms, the, in, in the representation that made it influential into the world. To give you an example, when you have the Beetle, you know, the car, you, you know, it's MoMA, so we could have acquired the pre-World War II split windshield historical piece. We opted instead for the 1959 one because that's the moment when the Beetle becomes the car of the 60s. We do the same also for fashion, for instance. And to do that, we, for each single item, we wanted to find the stereotype. And the stereotype is very scientifically and scholarly explained in this way. Close your eyes, and if you think of that item, what do you see? You know, but really, that's the proof in the pudding. We chose, to give you an example, the sari. 
even though uh, we are not Indian, we had a lot of Indian friends, and I personally traveled to India, we were asking all our Indian friends, if you close your eyes and you think of a stereotype that you can live with, what is it? So in this kind of empirical way, we chose the stereotypes. But then MoMA also believes that the past is very important for the formation for the making of modern and contemporary. So we also wanted to look at the archetypes. No, nothing has ever been invented yesterday. There's always a predecessor. So the archetypes are displayed in the exhibition either by slideshows or images. And then in a few cases, when either new technologies or new needs, um, social, political, technological, emerged, we also commissioned new prototypes. You can see it, for instance, in a beautiful version of pantyhose for people on wheelchairs by a great designer called Lucy Jones that works on people with people for, that have disabilities. Or you can see it in the amazing um, re thinking of the chinos, of the khaki dress, by a group of Johannesburg-based designers and artists called the Sartists. We have really tried to address our most urgent uh, needs, you know, the need to rethink also geographically certain items with these prototypes. So many of the items that you decided to identify, at least in the first list of 111, are culturally charged items, right? There's the hoodie, um, the bikini. Talk a little bit about the sort of social and political dimension of identifying certain things that we wear mm -hmm. and treating them as design objects. You know, in Italy, they teach you that everything that is not your family is politics. And uh, I, I kind of, I train myself that way, so I, I see... That's why you're so good. <laughs> I, I see politics also in the Breton shirt, you know. Right. But, of course, there are some items in the exhibition that are immediately political. Um, a year ago, we put Colin Kaepernick's jersey in the checklist. It's not something that was done last week. And it's amazing to see what happened to it now. And the hoodie, of course. The hoodie is one of the most important items in the exhibition from all viewpoints, but especially politically. Um, the hoodie started out, well, of course, it goes back in history, but in the incarnation that we know, it to, that we know today, it was 1930s. It was to keep athletes warm. And then it progressively got adopted by, you know, cold storage workers, athletes in college, their girlfriends, and then in the 1980s, kids that went, wanted to skateboard in the city and not be seen. You know, so it has this uh, implication. It's extremely functional and protective, and we like to say that it gives you the false impression of being invisible. It's like when a child keeps the hands in front of the face and thinks that dad and mom cannot see him. Um, but it's a double-edged sword because we know what happened. You think you're invisible, other people think you're threatening, and then tragedy strikes. So the simplicity of these absolutely functional garments that because of history become invested with so much power is a marvel. Um, and we want people to come into the exhibition recognizing that anything that they wear anytime is, can be a symbol, and a symbol that is world-changing. So let's take a moment and turn this over to all of you if you have questions, because this is such one of these topics that we're going to go on for, and can go on forever about, but we want to make sure you all have an opportunity to ask Paola what might be on your minds. By the way, behind us is a proof in the pudding, the bikini, which people think became outrageous only in the 20th century. Look, this goes back to the beginning of the Roman Empire. Yes, please. Hi, uh, you were talking about stereotypes. Um, I noticed that some, some things had um, multiple versions, the black dress, the suit. Um, what, what made you kind of decide to show breadth of options for those? Well, when you think of the little black dress, it's a concept more than an item in, unto itself. So in order to really define the concept, which is 
the color remained constant, the silhouette changes, we needed to show more than one. And we decided to go with an excursus through history. And in this case, you know, Stephanie Kramer, the, our resident uh, fashion historian, was really strong at that. We just punctuated the history with all these different silhouettes that kind of gather around the uh, importance of the dress. The platform shoe, same thing. It was important to show its change in materials and the same uh, with the shift dress. It's fascinating across the exhibition, whenever you see more than one piece across the century, when you look at the World War II examples, some of them are the most interesting, the ones when the materials were rationed and so you couldn't have copper rivets in the Levi's 501s or you couldn't have leather in the shoes. So those are quite important to tell the history of a type. Yes, please. Uh, oh, we'll go back there and then we'll come down to you. Thank you. I would be lying if I told you, oh yes, that's what we planned from the beginning. Sometimes you um, you just express who you are, and uh, uh, and the, this particular curatorial team is very much in, in the present. So we decided to make a very New York-centric exhibition. And when I say New York-centric, I mean not that it's all about people in New York City, but that it has the character of New York City. So this kind of know-it-allness attitude and also a healthy curiosity and uh, a certain arrogance. So I guess that um, that that kind of transpires. But um, I have to say that the curatorial team is all made of young women, except one intern, Oliver, that also is a young man and an honorary woman. And, uh, and we're all pretty much um, brought up here, with some exceptions. I, I, I might just add, because from my perspective, what I certainly wasn't expecting, uh, and nor would I have ever expected it with Paolo, but I wasn't expecting it in general, was an exhibition on fashion that had a historic dimension. For all sorts of reasons, this institution has not engaged with fashion qua fashion on anything remotely like a regular basis if we do these kinds of exhibitions once every 70 years. I hope the next one will happen much more rapidly. I was expecting an exhibition, and I think Paula delivered it, that was about the present, that asked questions about how certain garments came to be, but that looked at them first and foremost through the lens of the moment. How do these items relate to our understanding about contemporary design? And what are their kind of lateral associations out into the world? And I think this exhibition argues strongly the case that what we wear writ large because there's certain things that probably one could never wear that are in the exhibition, but what we wear writ large is part of who we are, and design affects who we are all the time. So for me, the, the pivot, if you want to call it that, and I'm glad you, you put your, your finger on it, the, the pivot to the present, the sense that this feels very much of 2017, speaks to the argument that fashion should be seen with the same seriousness that we look at contemporary design. Mm -hmm. at, at least that's how I understood what Paolo was trying to do. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question in the back. Hello. Um, I might be wrong, but I don't think I saw a traditional wedding dress in the exhibit. So I was just wondering if it made, why it didn't make it in the top 111 or? It was on the list? I, I think we nixed it. Do you want to talk about it? The nixer. I, um, this is Michelle Millar Fisher, who's the curatorial assistant to the show. I, I let her speak because I probably nixed it right away. <laughs> we did have it on the list. We had a lot of them on the list that we, it made it close to the end, um, but the, as you said, Paolo, the deliberate provocation of the question was 
that it should be an open-ended list and people can add to it or subtract to it. We really hope as people come into the exhibition that they point out what is missing as much as what they enjoy. Um, but we had many arguments over the table saying, I want this. One of the, I mean, Anna had the sock for a long time. I had the hazmat suit for a long time. Uh, Steph, what was one that you missed? <laughs> so yeah, the wedding dress was on there and we have this much longer list, but Maybe it's number 112. Yeah, that's Start exactly. Start the arguments now. No, no. We're, we're probably going to have a social media campaign. We're thinking about it with asking people to name 112. And also, when you get to the exhibition in the wall text, in red, you see the hashtag that we are giving people so that they can tell us what we missed. And we want that. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, okay. I noticed a remarkable absence of items connected to cinema. And I think that might be deliberate that so many garments we connect to cinema that you just cut out the screens. Could you, for instance, name one? I, I just noticed that when you mentioned, for example, um, uh, where there are movie stars, they are seen in private or they are seen in their political uh, connections, Jane Birkin, mm -hmm. uh, Liz Taylor, uh, Vanessa Redgrave. But you don't have, for example, the Clark Gable T-shirt even mentioned, or dresses, Catherine Hepburn with the pants. I just noticed that. So this is not what the exhibition was about. In the catalog, we have more pictures that sometimes depict, you know, for instance, we have for the ballet flats, we have Brigitte Bardot, and we have a few, Im few more images. But the exhibition was about the object. And the movie stars sometimes came in to get into play to support the objects, but we didn't want the exhibition to be about them. It was really about the items. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> yes, here. Then if there are people in the back, just shout, because sometimes with the lights it's hard to see. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting exhibition. Um, I'm sure that it was very challenging for you to choose uh, one, ob one item among the many choices. And uh, I'm sure there are people who will say, you know, I would you know, chosen different item. For example, uh, for backpack, you chose Prada. And I was wondering why you chose Prada. Would you please explain? The choice of the Wait, Prada. She is from Milan. <laughs> I mean, we just got to get that out. Okay, sorry. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to counter her with a Japanese example. Um, no, um, the choice of the Prada backpack is not dissimilar from the choice of Y3 and Yamamoto because it's the two moments in the history of fashion where something utilitarian and sports um, related becomes high fashion. And uh, it's very similar. So Yamamoto deliberately decided to make better sportswear because he thought that the shoes and garments that existed at that time were offensively ugly. And instead, Miucha Prada didn't, was not so outspoken, but she took a new type of nylon that had become available, a typology, the backpack that had been around for centuries, made the backpack, put the little logo onto it, and the little triangle is as powerful as anything. And all of a sudden, there was this transposition of something very utilitarian into high fashion, and it even started a whole market of counterfeits. So it was a big phenomenon, and it's that backpack in particular. We were thinking, we were considering also a Jansport backpack. Jansport is the company that made instead the backpack that became the student's backpack. But so we had these choices that we had to ponder. Yes, in the back, are there any questions? Yes. Please. Uh, hi, Paola. This is more a remark. I was really impressed with the, the ghetto stuff that you had, the hip hop and the ghetto stuff, which was certainly the way that 20th and 21st century fashion did change, that all of a sudden these languages became part of the general language in fashion. The ghetto earrings, the, the two uh, jackets. I mean, I think actually your comment cuts to one of the more important dimensions of this exhibition, which is to try and show how fashion works, how, how things migrate across communities as the language itself changes, the meaning changes, but the object is still very present. 
I remember when we did an R&D salon, you spoke at that, and Kim Hastrider spoke at that. It was the high and low salon. And if you remember, Kim made this impassioned presentation that showed how so many things are born of subcultures and then become mainstream. And in the exhibition, also, we addressed head on the problem, the issue of appropriation. Um, that's what uh, I'm glad that you made that remark. I think it's important to notice that many single individual items in the show en enable us to talk about social issues that are maybe not as magnified and as present as the, um, the um, NBL um, protest right now or the hoodie, but they are still subtle and powerful. Like the term appropriation, as you might know, is when main... Um, governing and dominating cultures, appropriate items from other cultures without giving credit. And, and we address that, for instance, with the door knocker hoops, and we speak about it. Yes, uh, again in the far back. An aspect of the exhibition was power, um, and you went into that with Bill Cunningham and what he said about how clothing imbues power upon those who wear it. Um, when you were drawing up the list, were you conscious of how many items were originally were intended for men and women? as gender is especially um, powerful or, you know, powers imbued upon genders differently? Well, interestingly, we did not uh, count, but in the end it was always present. And what was very present was also an awareness of the, of the fluidity of, the, of so much. And when you talk about power, I want to bring back also Glenn and this idea of the binary. Um, when we got to speak about power at the end of the exhibition, and we showed Glenn the kind of suits that we wanted to display that were mostly men's suit with some, some adaptation for women at the end by Armani, he just said, you know, usually it could happen today that the guy that's wearing the three-piece suit could be the bodyguard, and instead the guy that has the real power is wearing the T-shirt. And that's why we put the white t-shirt at the end. Actually, that was Michelle's idea. When after Glenn spoke about that, we were like desperately trying to decide what to put at the end. We were thinking of the whole um, gray t-shirt hoodie and uh, jeans outfit, which we can imagine who it reminds us of. But then inside the curatorial team, we were saying, no, that's only for guys. What is the equivalent of that for women? And so we kept on talking about it for weeks and weeks and weeks until Michelle said, well, what about the white t-shirt? But so, um, yes, we thought about it, but without counting. Yes, please, here. It's coming, microphone is coming. Okay, thank you. Um, I was curious, uh, along the line of power, uh, the Paco Rabanne aluminum uh, piece dress, yeah. I was curious why you chose that one instead of the one that was done with credit cards. Well, we wanted to really show, the one with credit cards would have stolen the limelight for different reasons. And instead, what we wanted to say with the shift dress was that the opposite of the little black dress was happening. With the little black dress, you kept the color constant and the silhouette was changing. With the shift dress, instead, you just opened it up and it was always the same silhouette and the material was changing. So it was very important for us to maintain the stark contradistinction between, say, the paper dress or the Helmut Lang lame dresses. We didn't want to get too much into the symbolic, the symbolism of the credit cards. Great question. We'll take one more question and then Paolo will be around to, to yes, please, on this side with the white shirt. Curious if uh, Fortuny pleading made the I'm list. Sorry? Fortuny sorry. pleading. Fortuny. Fortuny. Oh, because uh, I feel that's so important. Um, like I'm like a child of the '70s, and I was, I didn't really know the history of it, other than, oh, that's Mary McFadden, in my mind. That's your 112. Send it to me. Okay. Thank you all. Keep building those lists. Send them in to us. Uh, let's see if we can get to 150 uh, by the end of the week. Uh, Paula, Michelle, and everyone who worked on this exhibition, thank you so much for an thank absolutely you, insightful <laughs> project. Thank you.